Welcome to Insurance Concepts Training. That sounds good. Uh, I'm Michael Ostra. I'm the Director of Training. We're having a conversation about insurance, our relationship with insurance, what it is, that sort of thing. And the reason I'm chairing that conversation is because I'm a licensed insurance agent. I have 15 years of um, industry knowledge about insurance from the insurance company's point of view. To my left are uh, my two co-hosts, and they're each uh, bringing their own unique perspective on this topic. Bethany, tell us about you. I'm Bethany Wheeler, and my experience with insurance mostly was as a consumer. I did have my health insurance license for a hot second. Um, and then I worked as a project manager with Bartlett for two months before I moved into the training department, and I've been with the training department for a month. So that is kind of where I'm coming at this conversation from. And my name is Mikkel Zitting. I come from more of a contractor background, working in storm restoration and dealing with negotiating with carriers and things like that. Um, I have a pretty heavy construction background and have spent a lot of hours talking on the phone with insurance adjusters about concepts with roofing claims and other casualty home claims. Fair enough. So that all said, um, kind of the idea is in the field, we get questions and in the field, in our sales training, actually, we're told certain things about the insurance and how we relate to them. And I want to make sure that we're all coming at this from the same perspective. So what we're going to do is just kind of hash out the various questions that that you're likely to hear in the field uh, amongst ourselves and what people understand to be true and, and what the law is and how that actually interfaces, where the rubber meets the road and, and how that can potentially make a consumer, in this case, our homeowners feel at the end of the day and how we can best sort of move that forward. So without further ado, let's talk about the questions. One of the things that we say, and we say it a lot, is we don't interpret policies. So can we reasonably then tell a homeowner, oh yeah, you're covered? Oh, you never make promises you can't keep. That's stupid. <laughs> that is so stupid. I'm not telling somebody, oh yeah, this is definitely getting done. That's just stupidity, because then what if you can't? We're definitely not a company of guarantees. We're a company of we're going to try our best yeah. for you. And we're going to use our professional knowledge to help you get this approved if it is applicable. Right. But it's not always that case. And we cannot look at a homeowner's house and assume that they have coverage for the roof even, let alone whether or not that policy is then going to cover the entirety of the roof. Right. Well, and I guess that kind of is the point. Um, when we knock on a door, even when we file an initial claim, we have no idea what the coverage, what coverage they've paid for. And we have no idea what coverage the insurance company is going to be willing to extend to the homeowners. And quite frankly, without, without working for the company, that insurance company in particular, we can't be telling them for certain it will or won't. Not even so much like I can't promise you it will or won't get done. I can't even tell you whether or not it is covered by your policy. Yeah. I knocked two different doors and the homeowner said my roof is not covered per my insurance policy. One of them, like the roof was like super janky and the insurance company knew that going in and, and there was an exclusion mm -hmm. on the roof that, mm -hmm. you know, they were not going to cover the roof. So you can never promise like, oh, yes, this is definitely written you know in your policy and it's going to happen they could have a hundred shingles missing on the roof and their policy could like you said have an exclusion mm -hmm. or it could be a depreciated policy where they're only getting a percentage of it back and we don't know these things until we have that carrier estimate in hand right and i think that's it's it's important to to explain that to the customer i'm not telling you your color coverage will or won't i'm telling you that if it will if it's covered, I think there's a, a high probability that that we can 
present this to the insurance company, but that does presume a couple of things. That presumes there's coverage there from the insurance company themselves. That, that brings to mind the notion of what is, you know, at what point are you interpreting a policy, right? You, you know, what, I, what I'm driving at there and what's important to me is that we don't go to the customer and say, oh, your policy says this, or when your customer says, well, you know, my agent told me it's not covered, do you then say to the, to the customer, oh, well, bring me your policy, let's see if that's true? No. Why? Because I am not smart enough to read that policy. <laughs> you know, I'm not a licensed adjuster and I don't get to decide what this means. Even right. though I might feel competent and I might feel like I can comprehend it, I did not train in this. I did not take the necessary courses to be able to interpret this policy language and how things are written. You know, I might be able to look at it and say, roof covered, yes. But that 16 paragraphs under it explaining what portions of the roof are covered and which portions may be excluded, I'm not going to be able to interpret that. I think, and this is where it gets a little, a little dicey. I, I do know what the policies say. But even as a licensed professional, I have no authority to tell the customer what their company will or won't do. I don't work for that company. Yeah. I don't have binding authority on that company. And that's where the adjuster, he has a license that says he's willing or able to make these kinds of assessments. We don't carry that license. And as it works out, it's a first party adjustment. So unless we had a license to adjust, we can't talk about, we can't tell them that, especially at the front end, I guess is what I'm driving at. Yeah. But then how do we have the authority to talk to the customer at all, or for the customer, rather? How do we have the authority to, to work for the customer on the, on the project? How does that work? The contingency agreement? The contingency <laughs> agreement. Why? Because it's saying, if I understand correctly, we are also a beneficiary of the claim, and so we are basically acting upon our own interest as well at that point because we have a stake in it, right? Essentially. Okay. It's the, it's the assignment of benefits is where that works. The assignment of benefits basically is saying, and it's a long legalese term, and I won't even bother to try to go through it because I don't know it off the top of my head, but the gist of it is saying the homeowner hereby assigns us as the beneficiary for this claim. So that makes us owners of the claim. We have the same rights to this claim as the homeowner themselves do. So when we call the company, we're no longer acting as an adjuster. We're acting as a claimant and we're negotiating on our own behalf. And there is a difference. We still can't interpret policy because we're still not licensed. I can't tell the insurance, the insured rather, I can't tell the insured, well, you know, this is the way that translates. What I can tell the insured is, well, we believe the roof is unrepairable for these reasons. And we're going to advocate from that perspective. Right? Yeah, from a contracting perspective. So I, as a contractor, am competent and qualified to assess the roof from a repairability standpoint. I'm not allowed to say whether that repairability reflects upon the policy but I'm allowed to tell them that this isn't repairable. And I think that matters um, because it's easy to get, it's easy in the field to get all fired up and go, oh, this absolutely is. Well, but is it? You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Does that distinction make sense? Like, I definitely think it does because you do have those moments in the field where you're like, oh, well, I did a house four do doors down mm -hmm. that had similar damage. It was fully covered. So this one should be. Right. But this person might not have the same policy as the person four do doors down. And so there could be a discrepancy in that as to why something's not being covered. Well, that brings an interesting question to mind too, doesn't it? Why does one homeowner get a positive answer and another homeowner, even with the same company, dealing with the same storm, looking at very similar damage, why do they get a different outcome? 
What do you think, Bethany? <laughs> because they have different adjusters. And I think that does play a factor into it. Different adjusters adjust differently. Um, when you're dealing with two houses with the same exact company, the same exact guidelines for insurance adjusting, things like that, um, from a contractor's perspective, there's certain things that play into it. And that would be things like repairability, watershed capabilities. So if you're dealing with a 912 pitch on a roof versus a 312 pitch on the roof, a few missing shingles might not affect the watershed capabilities as it would on a lower slope roof because then you're getting stagnant water caught in those because it's not going down at the same velocity. And so different things like that from a construction standpoint could yield different results on how somebody is justifying whether a roof is or isn't repairable. Um, it could be a house facing north versus a house facing east. So the sun is then inflicted different damages. So even though it's only three doors down and had the same storm hit, that roof might've been able to take on the storm differently depending on like sun fading, granular loss, things like that. And so there are a lot of different factors that play into repairability, even though they might be neighbors. Right, and I think that's, that's, that's a legitimate thing to consider. Should we, as salespeople, be telling the customer, oh, because I got Bob down the street done, I know I can get you done. My take is, of course, we should not. What do you think? I mean, I think it's always good to share stories of what we were able to do. But again, you never promise anything. Um, so how would you phrase that? I say, you know, I was able to help out some of your neighbors and I'd like to do the same thing for you. And so it's like you might. And then when you get up there and you see the kind of damage they have, the brittleness of the roof, find out who their insurance company is, things like that. Then you get into conversations about, well, you know, Typically, what we see with this, or there's a really strong chance, or you don't have a chance at all, but at the same time, we've seen crazier things happen. And so I, I think just going off that. That leads right into that notion, at least to my mind. It leads to that point where it's... It, it flows from the idea of different companies and different adjusters. Yeah. I can definitely see how... Different adjusters, let me see how to phrase this. There's some subjectivity to this. It's not hard and fast. I see that something's missing. And now I look at it and I go, well, that's because of wind. And you look at it and you go, well, but is it? <laughs> right? So I think part of it is there's just the subjective nature of what we're doing. So some adjusters are going to see things one way and other adjusters are going to see it different. But then the other thought process or the other thing is the guidelines the adjusters are following. I mean, let's talk about the different carrier behaviors for just a minute. You know, some carriers look at wind torn at the fasteners and they say, oh, yeah, whatever. Those are covered. Done. No problem. Other companies, it's it's you know, we have to take them the 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 material, the source material from the Hague training to prove that those are, in fact, wind damage. Right. Yeah, definitely. And there are a lot of variables for different insurance companies and working with insurance companies for the last few years you kind of pick up on these traits because even as simple as you know one carrier will pay for chimney flashing while the other carrier will only write for l metal it's the same thing but it's two different line items two different price points and so just learning these different characteristics of how carriers write makes it a lot easier to work with them and get things approved quicker because if we know what they need to approve something then we can preemptively do that rather than arguing back and forth saying no it's this way no it's this way it makes it a lot easier to get that initial approval from the insurance carrier if we're just kind of learning their habits i'd like to dive into that just a little bit deeper so <laughs> You're telling me that a company will say, well, we're not going to pay for uh, this drip edge removal and replacement, but we're going to give you D-metal. Yeah. That, that's, that's a different term for the same thing. No, and I understand. And it, is, <laughs> it has a lot to do with different carriers um, estimating systems and things like that, mm -hmm. different 
carriers use different price lists for things. Um, like for example, some carriers will write for starter and ridge cap. Some will just add one extra square of shingles to cover that starter and ridge cap. At the end of the day, we're hitting the same price point. They're just required to use a different line item than we're used to. Fascinating. Yeah. On my last approval, when I was talking with the adjuster on it, I had my tear off and my dumpster as two separate things. And he was like, no, we just have that all rolled into one. We don't we don't write yeah. for the dumpster. We just write it in for the tear off. Yeah, the tear mm -hmm. off, haul off and dispose. Yeah. And it really just goes down to the standards of how they're taught to write estimates and the standards mm -hmm. that that company uses. And it varies from ours. Neither of us might be wrong, but it's two different answers. It is just interesting. And, and that's a, a good point to, I think, make. When we talk about our relationship with insurance companies, there's a... I think it's easy to assume that it has to be adversarial. And I could see where them coming back and saying something like, no, 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 we're not going to pay for both of those things. We're paying for this thing here. Well, what they're paying for is both of those things just in a combined line item. We're still at the same point. It's easy to look at it and say, they said no, they wouldn't pay for a thing. It's not that they're not paying for a thing, they're paying for it differently. This doesn't necessarily need to be a fight. Yeah. Um, and so I think a bit of understanding where they're coming from is useful, right? What happens if something needs to be covered and the insurance company's not not looking at it? And then what? I mean, I think you uh, sometimes they just want proper documentation. Like mm -hmm. I've had adjusters tell me, "Hey, can you send over pictures of that second layer so I can write for it?" So that's uh, for your inspection. Take really good pictures and right. do a really good inspection. Um, it'll save you from driving to that town that's 45 minutes away to get the documentation you need. Um, and so I think some of it is, you know, just making sure that you can provide them why we need it. You know, why we need a steep charge because it's a seven pitch or whatever. Um, I feel like there's more I was going to say there, but, you know, it stopped yeah. at this point. It's what happens. <laughs> I, I run out of thoughts and words. I think that... I think that we don't need to assume that it is going to be a hostile conversation. I think we need to understand that. They're people and they make mistakes just like we do sometimes. Yeah, but I think even more fundamental, that's, that's actually a valid point. They're people, treat them like people and you'll have a better result if you treat them like, yeah. you know, if you act like a troll, they're not gonna respond well to you. If you act professional and, and polite and respectful, they're generally gonna return that. I think that when we talk about the standards that each company has, the mistake we make is that we, at least I did, in the very beginning, it wasn't this way, but after a while of working, I, I kind of started wanting it to be an us versus them, and it, and it didn't need to be. I think they have... They have standards, but what's the purpose of their standards? Well, it's the same as your standards. You're not going to pay for something you don't have to pay for. Yeah. You just won't. If I came to you and said, hey, buy these new shoes, and you looked at your current shoes and said, well, my shoes aren't worn out, right? I would not buy new shoes. My wife would, but that's a secondary conversation. Actually, she likes purses, but again, neither here nor there. <laughs> You digress. <laughs> <laughs> From time to time. But the point is, like, the insurance companies only want to pay for, and this is, I think, what you're driving at, they are only going to want to pay for that which they must pay for. And so it's incumbent, to, it's incumbent on us then to prove that it needs to be paid for and show them, no, this was here and, and it needs to be replaced and this is why. Um, and I think that's something that gets lost. We get into this the competitive nature of people like it's it's got to be this fight it's got to be this this go 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 we want to win we want to win well, you know i don't like to lose i'm gonna get that 
it's just a thought process. Let's let's shift gears just a little bit though. 